Before we begin today's show, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Posh Virtual Receptionists and Axiom. Welcome to the Modern Law Library. I'm your host, the ABA Journal's Lee Rawls, and today's episode has been in the works for a while now. If any of you listening used to read the Babysitter's Club books when you were younger, it's what they call a super special. First up, I have an interview with author Lisa Napoli about her book, Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki, The Extraordinary Story of the Founding Mothers of NPR. And after that, we are going to get to hear from one of those founding mothers herself, Nina Totenberg, the legendary Supreme Court reporter, whose book, Dinners with Ruth, A Memoir on the Power of Friendships, has just been released. Nina spoke about her book, her friendship with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and what the justice really thought about the notorious RBG meme. The audio was recorded at an American Bar Foundation event in July and can be released now that Dinners with Ruth is on the shelves. But first, we'll find out more about the beginnings of the outlet that made Nina Totenberg a household name, National Public Radio. Today, I'm joined by Lisa Napoli, author of the book, Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki, The Extraordinary Story of the Founding Mothers of NPR. Lisa, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I personally did not realize how young NPR is. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, as someone who was born in 1980, uh, it just always was around. And I assumed, oh, this must have been since the beginning of radio. NPR is just a thing. And that just is not the case. Can you ground us a little bit in National Public Radio's beginnings? Sure. Well, you were born in 1980, which is the same year that CNN was born, the subject of my previous book. And after I finished (laughs) writing that book and detailing crazy Ted Turner's life and the crazy run-up to that, because people cannot believe that news was not always 24-7, I stepped back and looked at radio, where I also had worked, and couldn't believe it myself. Uh, You know, radio is, it's not that it's a relatively new medium, but FM radio is a relatively new medium. And educational broadcasting used to be this little sleepy thing attached to schools where pretty much anybody could come in and talk on the radio for a while or have community forums or all kinds of localized content. Uh, Nobody called it content back then. And then in uh, the late 60s, a lot of people were starting to free out, Lee, about the impact of television, which had sort of big-footed radio off the stage, on the American psyche. Everybody was starting to worry, uh, are, are Americans becoming couch potatoes? They're lazy, they're disengaged, they're sitting on the couch. Uh, the remote was just coming into being then, and there weren't that many channels. So a group of people started forming public television And a bunch of people who were involved with this educational radio across the country said, hey, wait, don't forget about us. And they got tacked on, radio got tacked on to this public television bill, which then became the public broadcasting bill and gave birth to what we know today as PBS and NPR. Now, all of that is interesting, I think, because we don't realize how how short a life these entities have, which are pretty powerful forces in our society. Certainly radio has grown tremendously. Public radio has grown tremendously in the last 10 years in terms of its reach and offering. Uh, But when it started, it was like CNN was in 1980, scrappy. Nobody knew it was there. Nobody really believed it would last if they even knew it was there. And it was extremely underfunded. And thus, it was populated by a lot of newbies uh, and and, uh, people who couldn't otherwise get jobs because it was not seen as a sort of blue chip, white shoe place as it is today. And I'm pretty sure to my specific audience, the most famous person that you talk about in the book is Nina Totenberg. So how did Nina Totenberg come to be involved with NPR? Well, what I love about this story is that all four women I write about came to it from a different vantage point in terms of their work backgrounds. But all of them, because they were women, couldn't get jobs anywhere else. And Nina is a particularly fascinating person because she dropped out of college to become a reporter. She loved the idea of working way more than she loved the idea of school. And I loved that it was her mother that actually encouraged her to drop out of college and take this journalism thing more seriously, which, you know, what a unique response. 
to, well, to someone's college age daughter. It was a unique response, but it's also interesting and important to point out that in the 60s, a lot of women didn't go to college. Today, of course, there's many people who still don't go to college, but it wasn't like the world was so completely different for women when Nina and the women I write about in this book were growing up than it is for women today. Not that it's easy for women today, but women of Nina's generation were not expected to go to college. And Nina was from a a family where her mother had gone to college and she was from a family where her father, you know, was a celebrated concert violinist and and teacher. Uh, So they were incredibly educated people, but it was not typical, even in educated families, that uh, that a woman, that a girl would go to school. So she did go to school, but she never really loved it. And she asked her mother if she could drop out to pursue this career as a reporter. However, that was not a welcoming place for women either. No, no industry was really terribly welcoming for women, except perhaps, you know, what they called the pink collar jobs, the teachers, the secretaries. Uh, and the minute you got married and certainly got pregnant, you were pushed out in those businesses too. But reporting, journalism, was absolutely not a place for women if they wanted to progress beyond being a research assistant pretty much the highest they could go. Women were uh, marginalized into the women's pages. So if a woman did get her foot into a newspaper, which was hard enough to begin with, she usually was routed toward the women's pages. The women's pages meaning society news, fashion news, cooking, uh, you know, the girly stuff (laughs) that um, only women could possibly cover. They could never possibly cover anything more ferocious than that. And I could just say, you know, (laughs) coming from a newspaper newsroom in the 2000s, -hmm. you know, those pages were now called the feature section. And even though I could show analytically how many people went to those stories and were very interested in them above some of the more technical hard news stories, uh, the editors above me really did not respect those reporters who did those stories. Wow, wow. So imagine if that was your experience in the 2000s, what it was like for young Nina Totenberg in the late 60s, early 70s, wanting to become what she said, Nancy Drew. She she loved the act of pursuit and, and sleuthing things out. You know, Nancy Drew looked like a really great lifestyle to her. She just had that innate desire to uncover information and talk to people. And And imagine in in that time, if you go to your editor and you say, I want to do a story, as she did, about uh, this new thing called the birth control pill. And imagine if your editor said to you, well, Nina, have you ever had an internal examination? Are you a virgin? Imagine if that happened today. Well, that did happen to her. And what she did was she said, oh, uh, no, I haven't. Yes, I am. And so she couldn't do the story because she was deemed unfit to do this story that she pitched, which really wasn't even classic women's pages for the time. Women's pages was who wore what to what wedding and which fancy rich people got invited to this particular ball or cooking stuff. It wasn't that kind of you know, what we would see is more investigative piece. So Nina was bucking up against this uh, in the newspapers that she was working in, in the Boston area where her family had moved because her father was appointed to, to Boston University. And basically, uh, she was incredibly discouraged. So she went to work for an even smaller paper in Peabody that was so understaffed that she was able to run around and cover things like city council meetings and local politics and and basically everything. If you've ever worked at a place like that, it doesn't really matter. You know, every, every story is done basically by one or two people. So she had done that. And uh, eventually she made her way to Washington because she just didn't, you know, she had more ambition than that. Nina was running around D.C. working for various publications, most of which do not exist any longer, that gave her a chance, mostly because they were startups and they needed to allow a woman to work for them because nobody else would work for startups. Uh, Few people were willing to work for these startups because they weren't glossy bylines. And Nina was moving around, running around, doing a great job covering everything in in Washington. And there was a need for a reporter at this new network 
called National Public Radio, which at that point still had not emerged. It still wasn't carried by very many stations in the country. FM was still not a predominant medium of radio. It was just it was just a sort of marginalized frequency that a lot of people couldn't pick up on the radios that they had. And so Nina sort of sailed in and got this job at National Public Radio because no one else really wanted to work there. And of course, as soon as she got there, she proved herself over and over and over again and breaking stories and working sources and navigating the thorniness of Washington, D.C., but it wasn't because she was a superstar that she got she got this job. Now, all four women that you talk about in the book seem to have a real knack for creating relationships and cultivating sources. And Nina Totenberg has become pretty famous for the kind of insider access she seems to have to the Supreme Court and other various you know, courts and the the legal people surrounding the real power brokers in D.C. But how did this all start? Because, you know, this isn't someone coming in like a reporter might today really rely on having, say, a law degree background to be hired into a position that would then report on the courts. That's not how Nina was coming to this. Well, you know, here's the problem. No woman was coming to any of this with anything more than their smarts and their tenaciousness. Uh, and you know, maybe, maybe you were born into a family like Cokie Roberts was, whose parents were both serving members of Congress. And, you know, she was from a rarefied family. But even then, it was hard for a woman to get work. So women stuck together, mostly. Of course, generalizations are always there's always holes you can poke in them. But women stuck together and women recognized that they had to work 10 times harder than men to prove themselves. The other thing that Nina has going for herself today is, uh, you know, here's a commercial for anti-ageism. You know, Nina has been covering this beat for decades and decades. She has institutional knowledge of Washington, D.C. that some incredibly brilliant law school graduate could absolutely not have if they walked into Washington, D.C. right out of school. You know, they could have every Ivy degree there was and every accolade, but she's worked that world for so long. She understands the history of the world so long. And she basically invented the idea of talking about a subject that most people, the average person, was not thinking about, certainly back when she started. When she started, people didn't discuss the law. They didn't discuss anything but major Supreme Court rulings in mainstream media because most people didn't necessarily know or care or want to. You know, of course, if you were if that was your world, you you educated yourself, you read up, you followed it. But the mainstream media didn't have that as a beat before she came along in any grand way. And what she did besides writing about it was talking about it. And her way of delivering something that couldn't be recorded was such a magnificent stroke of genius. Uh, She turned it into a performance with a healthy dollop of the analysis and understanding that she's crafted for herself over the years, being immersed in this world. And, you know, all those things colliding together, it's a once in a lifetime. You think when she stops doing it, you know, someone's going to try to do it too, but they're never going to do it the way she did because she is a singular force. And it was really a collision of time and gender and circumstance. And, you know, she didn't set out to become a Supreme Court reporter, the you know, preeminent interpreter of the law for the land. She just made herself that way, literally by circumstance and pluck. And today it would be a completely different, you know, casting for that role would be a completely different situation. We're going to take a break to hear a word from one of our sponsors. When we return, I'll be speaking more with Lisa Napoli, followed by remarks from Nina Totenberg herself. You're no stranger to compromise. You're a lawyer. But getting the legal team you need is a compromise you shouldn't have to make. Like when you have to invest in hiring a full-time generalist lawyer when you need a highly specialized IP counsel. Or when you don't want to bring in your external law firm with their partner-level price tag. Axiom can help you match the right legal resource to the right matter at the right cost for the right duration. No legal leader should compromise their high standards. And with Axiom, you don't have to. 
Learn more at axiomlaw.com slash ABA. As a lawyer, ever wish you could be in two places at once? You could take a call when you're in court, capture a lead during a meeting. That's where Posh comes in. We're live virtual receptionists who answer and transfer your calls so you never miss an opportunity. And the Posh app lets you control when your receptionist steps in. So if you can't answer, Posh can. And if you've got it, Posh is just a tap away. With Posh, you can save as much as 40% off your current service provider's rates. Start your free trial today at posh.com. I love that you point out that in some of her early reporting, she actually describes what the environs are like. She'll say, this is what the furniture looks like. Here is what the room in which the Supreme Court justices sit looks like. And actually painting a picture for people and in some ways humanizing the justices where, you know, they just were some unknowable bank of nine people uh, for, for much of the country's history. Right. And and that is, you know, that the whole news media, the entire news media have changed, of course, with the course of her career and the careers of the women I write about in this book. The world has changed. So conventions and journalism are so different, too. You know, if I, I haven't read exhaustively Supreme Court coverage from— 50 years ago in the New York Times. I grew up reading the New York Times in New York, and it was a different, the whole tenor of all coverage was different. So there's a whole zeitgeist or ethos that's that's completely different. And she is, is, you know, hugely responsible for how we perceive, we as a general public, not necessarily the people listening to this, but the general public perceives this, the entity of the Supreme Court of justice coverage in general. She's elevated it to a new world. It's really importantly that I point out that this book was unauthorized. Nina Totenberg didn't ask me to write this book. Uh, None (laughs) of these women asked me to write this book. NPR didn't ask me to write this book. So it's completely based on research that I've done reading her coverage over the years, researching her story, reading and listening to dozens, if not more, stories and interviews with her over the years uh, as she's as her career has developed and the same with the three women who I also write about in the book were you able to speak to any of the four women in the book well Koki was deceased when I started writing the book and that's part of the reason that that prompted me to write that book my earlier book was about the creation of CNN and my editor at Abrams Jameson Stoltz asked me if I would write a book about Koki after she passed away and I thought about it because Koki is a fascinating person as is her whole family and as I I had worked in public radio at the public radio show marketplace myself and so as I poked around I realized that these four women were a force in the early days of NPR. And as you said, a lot of people even who've worked at NPR for a long time didn't realize the history, didn't understand the history of the place. So, and certainly many listeners had no idea. So that's when we, when I decided to work on this book and I reached out to the three women who are still alive. And Nina did call me back. Initially, Susan was reticent. I I won her over. But, you know, in a book like this, where you're looking at the history, the documentation and the uh, anything that exists over the last 30, 40 years is is almost richer than interviewing someone today about what they thought about or did or wore or said back in 50 years ago. You know what I'm saying? It's that's, that's how historical research really is done and sort of checked in balance with what someone said. So yes, I would call Nina up and asked her, asked her a number of questions to verify things that I read in the Scarsdale newspaper where she grew up uh, and and such. But it's not it's not based as you know some people might think on extensive interviews because interviews are memory can be sketchy. So a lot of it is is based in in research from the time. So there are many many issues that you actually end up going over in the book. And you use the lives and backgrounds of these four women who became so important to NPR uh, to frame them. But I have to ask, what do you think was one of your main takeaways after researching this book um, about you know the times that Nina was coming up through or what NPR reporting like hers has done for society? 
Well, you know, it's a combustible moment in time that was very exciting to read about and capture. Uh, I was alive during the time, but I was a kid, so I, I wasn't really paying attention to it. And knowing in hindsight what women have struggled with, I, I got out of college in 1984. So knowing what I've had to deal with in my career as a woman, as a working class woman, making her way in the world, uh, the challenges and the, and the headlines that we that we grappled with at that time, breaking the glass ceiling, how to juggle family and career, uh, you know, still issues that are relevant and, and discussed today, but that was when they were first making the front pages. So stepping back a decade or so and seeing that women like Nina Totenberg, who's such a force, had to struggle with being accepted, with making her way in the industry, uh, that she almost didn't make her way in the industry, and that if she hadn't collided with this place, National Public Radio, and National Public Radio needed to hire People like Susan Stamberg, Linda Wertheimer, Koki Roberts, and Nina Totenberg, because men wouldn't take these jobs because they paid so poorly and had such a low profile. All of that came together in this perfect little box for me as a storyteller to serve up on a platter. And I think it's very important. I've spoken, I spoke at a law firm to, to young women associates a, a year or so ago, and the women were blown away to hear and to learn that it wasn't, that how difficult it was for women uh, not very long ago. So I, my biggest takeaway uh, is, is, just a more intense appreciation than I already had for the idea that everything is very difficult now. There's lots of change happening now. There's lots of struggles, but the struggles from back then, we, we've definitely progressed from back then. You know, very important to say that another critical point for NPR today even is whether they bring in ethnic and racial minorities to be on the air and to work behind the scenes. And that was also a huge point of criticism back in the 60s and 70s as public broadcasting was emerging. So all the discussions we're having are the same, and except the, the opportunities were even less back then. And that somebody like Nina busted through is, as I say, testament to both her force of nature, her tenacity, and also just a healthy dollop, all four women would say, of, of timing. So your book, Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki, The Extraordinary Story of the Founding Mothers of NPR, is available and out there. What are you working on next? You've covered, you know, the birth of CNN. You've covered the birth of NPR. What's your next project? Oh, wow. Well, thank you for asking. I'm not quite sure. I couldn't sell a book earlier this year about April 9th, 1939, the historic day when the famous singer Marian Anderson sang at the foot of the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, I wanted to do sort of a 360 perspective of that, but couldn't couldn't find a publisher. But I am thinking about looking at this very strange, because I do cover the, I love covering the media and emerging forces in the media. So I'm looking at this very strange offshoot of QVC that a lot of us worked for right before the birth of the internet. So we'll see how that goes. But yeah, it's, uh, it's a crazy time in the book world. And it's, it's, it's a challenge to sell books in this day and age, but I'm grateful for how much this, this book about Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki has been received because I think people do have a voracious appetite for understanding the media more than ever and how it, how, a, what a force it is in our a culture. We're going to take a break to hear a word from one of our sponsors, followed by remarks from Nina Totenberg herself. The ABA Journal Legal Rebels podcast features the men and women in the legal profession who aren't satisfied with good enough. These are the people who are changing the way law is practiced and setting the standards that will define the profession in the future. Each episode, we share their story. To hear insights from those with an eye fixed towards tomorrow, follow the Legal Rebels podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. In a world that's constantly changing, the law and how it's practiced must also evolve to keep up with those changes. 
The APA Journal's Asked and Answered podcast dives into the compelling stories surrounding lawyers' personal and professional lives. I'm your host, Stephanie Francis Ward, and each month I bring on a new guest to explore their involvement with our dynamic legal ecosystem. For the stories that bring the law to life, follow the ABA Journal's Asked and Answered podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. It's now time for the segment you've been waiting for, Nina Totenberg in her own words. Nina was a special event at an American Bar Foundation event in Washington, D.C. that was celebrating the launch of the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Endowed Fund for Research in Civil Rights and Gender Equality. She spoke with E. Thomas Sullivan, the president of the ABF, in front of an audience including former Ginsburg clerks. Here are some of the highlights from their conversation. Because she was very shy and very quiet and soft-spoken, People thought that she wouldn't be a good performer. She was a star performer. That's how she got where she was. But she wasn't a particularly socially star performer unless asked to be brought out or unless she was with a close group of friends who she knew well. And even then, she relied on Marty to provide most of the entertainment, but not when, she, when it was her job to do it, whether she was an advocate or later a judge or giving a speech. If you saw Ruth Ginsburg give a speech, it was almost never longer than, unless it was, you know, a lecture. It was not, it, not usually longer than 25 minutes if she gave a speech. And it was always a great speech. It was slow talking. That was <laughs> Ruth. She talked very slowly. But she never lost people's attention when she gave a speech. And so she was a great performer. You can see, as Nina recalls the friendship, one of the themes that comes back in her book, it's so powerful as she wraps all of these personal, deeply personal relationships together, is this notion that friendship is important in the good times and in the tough times. That's true friendship. And we see that throughout the book. And a phrase that I really love, Nina, and I think I've used in my life earlier, is this wonderful phrase, and it's apropos to tonight. Uh, A moment ago, I thanked you all for coming. Thanks for showing up, because a wonderful phrase that you have is showing up in life to help other people in the good times and in the tough times. Where those challenges lie, that's real character, showing up. Nina, I'd like to turn a question that goes back a few years. Your very first conversation with the justice before she was on the court, and you call her from a a phone booth, and you asked her a very basic question, and that was? I had just read her her brief in Reed versus Reed, and I didn't understand it. I was 20-something years old. I hadn't gone to law school. P.S. I frankly, hadn't graduated from college. I just went off to be a reporter after my junior year. And so this goes to prove that all of you who are lawyers and you think constitutional law is the highest calling, it is the highest calling in many ways. However, it is not rocket science. (laughs) If you read enough and think about it, people used to read for the law, and and, and I have read for the law. Of course, don't ask me to draw up a contract. God help you. Um, But in that first conversation, I called her from a phone booth in this Supreme Court press room, which was the size of this square here. Probably that it's not even that big. And I I just I because I didn't understand the brief because it said that women were covered by the 14th Amendment, which was enacted before women even had the right to vote. I was a little puzzled. So I flipped to the front to see who had written the brief, and it had her name and her telephone number, and I called the phone number, and she answered, and I explained to her that I didn't understand the brief, and I got an hour-long lecture. (laughs) I got a wonderful hour-long lecture, which, showing you what I do for a living, boils down to the 14th Amendment uh, guarantees equal protection of the laws for all persons. And women are persons. (laughs) So that was our first conversation. And I think we did not meet for some time. I would call her regularly to 
just talk to her or ask her about cases. And and then we met finally at a an extremely boring conference in New York. <laughs> and I could I maintained that it was an <laughs> about arbitration. She maintained it was about something else. And I, the only the only reason I think I'm right is that at that point in my life, everything I did was so new and so different and so important that I think it was more way more important to me than it was to her. However, the key fact is that it was so boring that we left and went shopping. <laughs> And she likes Stuart Weissman's shoes, I believe. Yeah, and one of the one of the stories that I tell in the book is about her during her radiation treatments um, in twenty. I get the years mixed up. Twenty nineteen, I guess it was. She had three weeks of intensive radiation at Sloan Kettering, and she decided she was going to treat it as a vacation and that she would go to museums and go shopping during the day and go to, in fact, she went to the theater at night and there's, a, there's an iconic photograph, not in the book, of Kate McKinnon, the imitator, who was there, just happened to be there that night for this production of I Don't Remember What, and the two of them shaking hands. And she walked into Stuart Weitzman and she said she wanted red shoes like the ones that she was wearing. And the saleswoman says, no, these aren't Stuart Weitzman. He changed his last. I, don't, I can't wear those anymore. Uh, so, and the saleswoman said, well, he doesn't make them in red. And Ruth said, well, why not? <laughs> and at some point, it dawned on people who this little lady in a, in a sort of a raincoat and a babushka was. And so they got hold of Stuart Weissman, like on the double, and, and he made those shoes for her in red. <laughs> My sister, who's a federal judge, says she likes all the shopping stories in this book better than almost anything else. <laughs> Well, Nina, you were talking a minute ago about the court, and this, this book is full of personal reflections on relationships that Nina, well in addition to Justice Ginsburg, have had. Uh, you have show great fondness for Justice Powell, for Justice Brennan, and, and Justice Scal Scalia. Would you want to share some of those reflections? Very different political experiences and backgrounds, of course, but you, you found them to be intellectually and socially so charming and so engaging. They were all incredibly special people. If I have a single criticism of the court today, other than the obvious ones that other people have, it's that it's a rather gray court. It's not gray in hair and age. It's a young court. But these are all people who are court of appeals judges and only court of appeals judges in any distinguished way in their careers. The only ones, you know, the, if you look at the people who we remember, and I was lucky enough to cover from, I actually covered Hugo Black and, and John Harlan, and even Earl Warren, I barely remember being in court that year, because it was the first year I covered the court, and it was pretty peripherally. But if you think of the great people that we identify in the court's last 75 years, they were all people who had distinguished careers in some way before they were judges. Whether it was Hugo Black, he was, the, he was a crusading New Deal senator and reformer, a great investigator who held important investigative hearings, to William O. Douglas, who actually created the modern administrative state in many ways. And established for all practical purposes the SEC, or Earl Warren, who was such a, a successful governor that he was actually nominated one, for one of his three terms by the Democratic Party, too. I mean, he was a hugely popular governor, which made him a very skilled political chief justice in the broader sense of political, not the partisan sense of political. Or Justice Scalia, 
who had had a, a, a very important career as an academic and as a person in the Nixon administration, or Felix Frankfurter, same thing, huge academic career. career. Or John Harlan, uh, who had an important career on Wall Street. If you look at the current court, those folks aren't there. These are people who are, you would actually think that we had a kind of European civil judicial service, but we don't. It's a political service with, it, it is a, it is a, it, one time, at one time, a lot of the, a lot of judges were named by politicians and were entirely unpolitical in their judicial philosophy. But it's as if we did have a judicial civil service that promoted people to the Supreme Court, but without any of the benefits of a civil service where they're not ever involved in politics and they're not selected because of their politics. We have the worst of both worlds now. <laughs> well, accepting the last point, this is a very important historical point that Nina makes in the book and she's just underscored. Justice Kagan is the only member of this court who was not a judge before. We, we have developed over the last uh, 15, 20 years, this notion that we have to only pick federal judges because they, they're the only ones ready for the Supreme Court, where you show in your book in a very popularized, accessible way, that's not the American history. Our Supreme Court justices have come from governors and senators and uh, vast differences in diversity of back backgrounds. And you say in your book, referring to Justice Brennan, uh, Brennan and Powell and Scalia and a few others you mentioned, Justice Stevens, that they are complex individuals shaped by many factors from their experiences, their wide and broad experiences before they go to the bench. And your point, I think, is so well taken. Uh, Nina, share with us the relationship between Justice O'Connor, our first woman justice, of course, and Justice Ginsburg. Uh, they served for many years together before Justice O'Connor uh, retired to take care of her uh, uh, ailing husband, John, who died of Alzheimer's. As Ruth often said, Justice O'Connor was a conservative Republican. But as RBG put it, on all of the gender discrimination cases, and discrimination cases in general, we were in, completely in sync. And they pretty much were. You, you know, by today's standards, O'Connor is, is a, would be viewed as a liberal on this court, and considerably probably to the left of even Justice Kennedy. But there is no center on this court anymore, and that's one of the very, I think, not good things, but that's because I'm a centrist in all ways. And I always think being a having a, a center makes sense in a democratic society, whether you're talking about politics or judicial philosophy. But clearly, not everybody agrees with me, and nobody hires me for my opinions, ex <laughs> except for maybe this small group of people from the American Bar Foundation, so I'll pop off. But we don't, it's the first time I've been covering the court my first year covering the court was 1968. And the first confirmation hearing I covered was Abe Fortas's. So I'm old. <laughs> or, let's put it this way, I was incredibly young when I did that. Um, and that, I have that's never... That's experience. Yeah, that's experience. That's experience. I have never, ever covered a court that didn't have a center, that w was completely dominated by one side or the other. And I just don't think that's healthy. I don't think it's healthy if the six were liberal justices, and I don't think it's healthy for it to be six conservative justices either. Tell us, tell us about, uh, and Kelsey opened this for us a few minutes ago, tell us about Notorious um, RBG. How did that happen? <laughs> well, it was her dissent in the voting rights case, and these young women made it a meme, and it just took off. And Ruth didn't understand it, and I didn't 100% understand it, and I still don't, except that Irene Carmon, who is um, 
one of the co-authors of the Notorious RBG book, which is sort of a, a compendium of some of this and of her sort of great stories about her. But she said that she thought that women, especially younger women, wanted real figures that they could have as heroes, not trumped up ones, not ones that were sort of pretend figures who were sort of PR mirages. But I don't entirely think that accounts for it. I think it's part of it. I just, I don't know what it was about her. She was 80 years old when she became a household name. <laughs> and she thought at first that it was really quite funny. And then she actually got to quite enjoy it. <laughs> and then she would, and she would bring along her trainer. When he put out a book, she would bring along his book to an event and, sh and promote it. <laughs> so, you know, for each person, the reason for the, how that Ruthian music played for them, I don't know. I think different people hear it differently. And, you know, she wasn't, and this was a generation that, a very young people who mourned her by and large, and let me tell you, she would not put up with a lot of stuff that you, like not coming to work. That would not be acceptable to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You freaking get your ass in here, <laughs> would have been what she says. You can't learn to be a lawyer remotely. <laughs> she, she absolutely would have said that, and she would have insisted on it. Maybe not five days a week, but for sure three. For sure three. And the only excuse would have been a newborn or something like that. I mean, my, my colleague, uh, we sent uh, one of my colleagues, one of my male colleagues, just had, he and his wife just had their second child. And I, stupid me, we all sent him a, you know, a present. And he wrote to say thank you. And I said something like, I'm going off on vacation. I hope I see you in September. And he wrote back, I'm off on parental leave until the first of the year. And I thought, bloody hell, that's a, that's a hell of a, of a well, he owes, I, and I wrote him, I said, you owe the union a hell of a debt, because we negotiated it, but that's a long frickin' time <laughs> to get off. Six months is a long time to have off. And it's, a, and it's, it's not her, it's him. So I think Ruth would have thought that was wonderful. But when, you, when that person came back, she would have expected 110%, not just 100%. Nina, you have in the book a revelation that I had not heard before. Um, and I'm wondering if other people here are the same. Uh, in 2013, President Obama invited the justice to lunch. Apparently had a conversation something like, well, because of the political calendar, you might think about retiring. 2013. Mm -hmm. Now, you say in the book this was never reported, and you, I don't think, knew no, about I, it until it, no, the New York, after. No, the New York after. Times eventually reported yeah. it. Um, long, I think, maybe even after she died. I, yeah, I think I that's think was, right. I think it was after she died. I certainly didn't know about it. But um, you say in the book she obviously didn't take the hint. No. <laughs> and you know, a lot of people have been very critical of her about that. I think... It, to me, it was pretty clear why she didn't step down. There were lots of different reasons. The first was that, you know, in 2013, she was healthy. She was at the top of her game. Her husband had died three years earlier, and she didn't want to leave. The second reason was that she didn't trust Mitch McConnell. She didn't think that somebody as good as her or anywhere near as good as her could get confirmed. And about that, she was very explicit to me. And the third thing was that she really wanted to give a woman president the chance to name her replacement. And she thought, like most people, certainly in the Democratic establishment, that Hillary Clinton would be president. If she had known that Donald Trump would become president and not George W. Bush or somebody like that, there's no doubt in my mind that she would have stepped down. But none of us have the gift of foresight. And if there's a person in this room who knew that in 2013, that he would A, be, that Trump would be president, much less in 
you know, 2016, please raise your hand because I need to call you regularly. <laughs> Nina, as we kind of uh, conclude our conversation tonight, could you share your personal thoughts about uh, what her greatest strengths were? Well, I think her greatest strength, in addition to the ones that Kelsey enumerated, was that she was a truly wise person, that she had the gift of wisdom and the, ex- the life experience of somebody who was not handed everything in life. The only thing that she was handed was her brains, and she made the most of them. The lucky thing that she had was that she married the right guy. I mean, that is a big luck. And it, it made her in a lot of ways, because he was happy to promote her. And f- for those of us lucky to be well married, we know what a great thing a happy marriage can be. But in addition to wisdom, she just was the most elegant writer. I always wish that I could write like Nino with that kind of flash. But in truth, that kind of flash was only in his dissents. When he had a majority, he didn't write like that. When she had a majority, she could write incredibly elegantly in the most complicated of cases so that you really could understand some pretty dense stuff. And when it wasn't all that dense, like the VMI case, or even the independent state legislature case, she could make it, as they say in, on TV, crystal. I mean, it just was so elegant and clear. The thing was, her little body failed her. She tried as hard as she could to make it past the election. I have no doubt that she would not have subjected herself to all of the treatments that she accepted in hopes of prolonging her life a little longer. But her brains were there to the end, absolutely to the end, almost scarily so, that she could not... I mean, I can't remember what I did yesterday anymore. (laughs) And did I take that pill in the morning? And all that stupid stuff. She never... I mean, she was pretty stupid about her own... I mean, her own medical care. She managed to have shingles for almost three weeks before she decided, well, they just weren't going to go away and go get them, go to see a doctor about it. And as a result, she had the pain from the shingles for the rest of her life. So people underestimate the amount that she suffered physically in the last few years of her life and how she simply just bore down to overcome it. You know, I've only known, there, I only use this about very few people. I would say she and my dad were the two most remarkable people that I knew well. They had special talents, each of them. My dad was a great concert violinist, and she was a great justice and advocate. Thank you for joining us for this super special episode of the Modern Law Library. And thank you to my guest, Lisa Napoli, and to the American Bar Foundation for sharing Nina's remarks. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast listening service. If you'd like to reach out with a comment, question, or a book recommendation, you can always reach me at books at abajournal.com. <laughs>